Hello, I'm Dr. Tara Palmatier of shrinkformen.com. If you have a question or would like to schedule a session with me, you can reach me at shrinkformen at gmail.com. This is the second video in a series on the topic of female stalking and harassment, or I should say, um, women who engage in stalking and harassment behaviors towards ex-partners or uh, individuals they would like to have as partners. And uh, it would also include um, the female ex-partner of a, a woman's boyfriend or, or a husband. That, ha that is also quite common in my practice. Um, so the first video discusses uh, different research and statistics on female perpetrators versus male perpetrators or offenders um, and the differences in how women typically stalk their targets or victims and how men who are inclined to stalk, uh, stalk their victims and also the, the mental health issues and personality disorders that are usually present in individuals who stalk and surprise, surprise, it often includes people who have borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, the other cluster Bs and, and dependent personalities and the paranoid. So um, let's get started uh, with the second installment, which uh, provides a checklist of common stalking and harassment behaviors and how can you distinguish that between uh, a woman who's really just that into you. So here we go. Oh, also this is from a series of articles that I wrote back in early 2011. Uh, so the written format is available and the link is in the video description below. Here we go. Female Stalkers Part 1, What is Stalking and Can Men Be Stalked by Women, discusses statistics and research on stalking behaviors, which gender engages in stalking behaviors more, what constitutes stalking, who is more likely to stalk, and why it's important for men to be able to identify stalking behaviors in women. This video provides a list of common stalking and harassment behaviors. It also discusses the distinction between non-dysfunctional romantic pursuit and stalking and harassment. In my opinion, male victims are more at risk than female victims of stalking and harassment. <gasps> okay, well, let me explain why. First, many men don't realize that their exes, girlfriends, and yes, wives, engage in behaviors that by the letter of the law, could be described as stalking and harassment, such as hacking into your emails, uh, demanding to read all of your emails and communications, etc. That's very common. In many cases, as I said, by the law, these behaviors are classified as criminal. Stalking and harassment are a form of abuse. In some ways, again, in my opinion, men are more at risk for these behaviors because many stalking acts engaged in by women are considered to be acceptable female courtship behaviors. To be clear, the behaviors cited in this article, which I'll get to in a moment, or video as the case may be, are not normal. They are often an indication of pathology. Male stalking victims are more vulnerable than their female counterparts because one, men are more likely to be held responsible for their own victimization. In other words, he deserved it. Oh, he, he just, he really likes all the attention, you know, the usual stuff. Two, Female perpetrators aren't considered as dangerous as male perpetrators, although the research and statistics do not support that erroneous belief. Three, society and law enforcement do not take male victims seriously. And four, stalking by an ex-intimate partner is generally considered less dangerous than stalking cases involving strangers. And uh, for anyone who's wondering where are my, where's the research to support this, um, if you go to the written article, uh, you will find all of the references. 
Okay. Several studies show male victimization can be just as severe as female victimization. Furthermore, ex-intimate partners have been consistently shown to be the most common and dangerous kind of perpetrator. While men comprise approximately half of stalking and harassment victims, they're still routinely portrayed as the predators in most of these cases and don't receive the same attention and support as female victims. Now I'm gonna get into the stalking and harassment list. Okay, when you first begin dating someone and are in the first blush of excitement, it's acceptable to text or email repeatedly throughout the day, explore the other person's interest, drop by to visit without an invitation and generally make yourself available to her or him. After a breakup, many of these behaviors may also be acceptable if one or both parties are attempting a reconciliation. But when do these behaviors cross the line from romantic pursuit to stalking and harassment? In order to compile a list of stalking behaviors, I reviewed four stalking, harassment, and perpetration assessment scales, including one, the composite stalking scale by Davis, Ace, and Andra, uh, and Diane Davis, two, the courtship persistence inventory by Sinclair and Fries, three, the relationship pursuit assessment by Kupak and Spitzberg, and four, the unwanted pursuit behavior inventory by Polaria and Langston Rawling. And the following list of behaviors are a compilation I created from these four scales. And they include spying on you. That includes spying on you via Facebook and other social media, okay? Following you driving by your house, place of work, school, or other locations where you're likely to be, tracing your whereabouts, activities, and other relationships on Facebook, Twitter, and other social media, hacking into your computer, email, Facebook accounts, etc., creating a false identity to gain access to your Facebook or social media pages, or enlisting a friend to do so. It's very, very common with the, the men I work with. Uh, not They're not doing that, but their exes do that and have their flying monkeys do that as well. Stealing your post mail, you know, going into your mailbox and taking stuff out, going through your trash, breaking into your car, home, or office, seeking out your friends, family, and colleagues to talk about you or get information about you, searching for information about you by means other than asking you for it, threatening to harm or kill herself or himself. Um, it, that's one of those things where there shouldn't be any, any confusion. That is absolutely not healthy, normal behavior. Threatening to kill yourself to manipulate another person is toxic and abusive in the extreme. There is nothing okay about it. And if there is an ex-girlfriend, boyfriend, or spouse who is doing that to you, call 911 and break up with them, okay? Uh, threatening to harm or kill you, threatening to harm or kill your children, your new wife, girlfriend, family members, or your pet, threatening your job and reputation, threatening your freedom by making false allegations to the police. Yeah, because nothing says I really wanna be your sweetheart than making up a, a fake rape charge. Uh, threatening to destroy your property or your loved one's property or um, their, their online reputation, okay? Sending you unwanted gifts, violating protective orders, verbally and physically abusing you, psychologically abusing you, vandalizing your property or a loved one's property, threatening to divulge information that would be harmful to you and blackmailing you, holding you physically or blocking you, your egress to force you to speak with or listen to her. Yeah, women do that too. Uh, they may not have the physical force to do it, but here's the thing that some of you who are sitting there shaking your head and getting all me too-y, um, most of the men I work with, 
they know full well that if they touch their girlfriend or wife or any woman for that matter, they can be accused of assault and arrested for it, even if it's to gently pick up and move a woman out of the way who is screaming at them and spitting in their face and blocking the doorway. So what most of my clients do when that happens is they just stand there and take it or they, they go sit in a corner and wait until she's done before they can leave. And yes, that does happen. Okay. So women are very capable of that. It, it happens to the men I work with routinely. Um, taking you someplace against your will to force you to talk with them, forcing you or tricking you into having sex, for example, getting you and, you know, you get intoxicated and, and they take advantage. Um, yes, uh, it's, it, women will do that too to men. Um, although I don't know if the same laws about uh, it's rape, if, if uh, I know it's rape if a woman has had a drink or it's not consent. I think in some states or on college campuses, if a woman gives consent after having a drink, I don't know. Technically, that should apply if uh, if the, the man has also had a drink, but I really can't make sense of those crazy laws. Um, let's see, doing unrequested favors, although many codependents do that, that's a boundary issue. Invading your personal space by standing too close or brushing against you, uh, showing up uninvited, to your home, school, or place of work to see you, calling you repeatedly to discuss the relationship or showing up on your doorstep uninvited to discuss the relationship, doing, uh, excuse me, seeking physical proximity by applying for jobs where you work, joining your gym, church, professional, social, sports groups, or clubs, moving into your neighborhood or building, et cetera. I've had that happen to men I work with. Um, and for the guys who are fishing off the company pier, <laughs> first of all, not a smart move, particularly in today's uh, you know, professional victim climate um, to, to fish off the company pier. Uh, second of all, if it doesn't work out, then you got to see the person. Like, seriously, don't do that. Um, manipulating or coercing you into dating or rekindling the relationship, making exaggerated expressions of affection to you and your friends and family, for example, saying, I love you within a few days or weeks of knowing you, uh, or after the breakup, doing unwanted favors, giving your friends and family gifts, etc. cetera. Um, let's see befriending your current romantic partner in order to harm the relationship and or monitor you, telling stories about you to your family, friends, and loved ones to show how well she knows you. Um, let's see, uh, trying to destroy your other relationships, both platonic and intimate, calling you repeatedly and hanging up. That's always fun. Uh, repeatedly texting, emailing, or leaving your voicemails. And it occurs to me because I wrote this back in 2011 before uh, spoofing and all of those other apps where you can create fake phone numbers uh, were in plentiful supply. But yes, you know, using a, a web-based application to generate lots of random phone numbers to, to call you and harass you. That goes on the list too. Uh, repeatedly texting, emailing, and leaving voicemails sending photos of herself or of the two of you or posting photos of the two of you together on Facebook after the relationship has ended and of course other social networks, um, smearing and defaming you online to get your attention or to punish you, objectifying you so that she can abuse, attack, malign and hurt you without feeling empathy or remorse. And that would be dehumanizing you in such a way uh, so that they can say really quite horrible things, but it's like, oh, hey, it's just this caricature of a person, so it doesn't matter. Um, leaving or sending threatening objects. Uh, for, for example, marked up photos of you, photos taken without your knowledge, pornography, weapons, drugs, bizarre objects like an animal heart that happened on the second season of The Real World. I remember that was London when I was back in college uh, before reality TV got really stupid. Um, 
uh, one client had an ex sent him a soiled feminine hygiene product. Uh, and another client um, uh, whose ex was formerly diagnosed with BPD put her vibrator and pictures of her using it on herself in his mailbox. This is while there was a non harassment order in place. And it may, uh, many of you may be quite unsurprised to learn that uh, when my client reported this to the police, they did not arrest her. And no, he was not turned on by the photos. His, his children from his first marriage live, you know, spend time with him. They could have gone into the mailbox and, and found that. It was nuts. Uh, stealing your personal objects to possess a part of you going to smell your sock. Uh, using the court and law enforcement to harass you, for example, making false allegations, filing restraining orders, because sometimes the actual, the psycho does that to the person they're targeting or petitioning the court for frivolous changes in custody, et cetera. It's about forcing you to see her or him and deal with them when you don't want to. Um, and this is, of course, when there you aren't doing anything that's already violating the terms of your custody order, if that's your situation. Um, attempting to take your children away or limit your access by making false allegations or engaging in parental alienation. I do believe that is also a form of harassment. Now, um, the items I just listed are by no means exhaustive. Additionally, research finds that female stalkers tend to be more creatively aggressive in their stalking acts, tend to engage in cyber stalking with greater frequency, are more motivated by the desire for an intimate relationship with their victim, and are more likely to engage in stalking activities during daylight hours than their male counterparts. Of course, I don't think this applies to stalking via the internet, uh, in my experience, my clients tend to get the craziest emails, uh, usually between midnight and five o'clock in the morning. And while I don't have any exes stalking me, at least not that I'm aware of, because they're not contacting me, um, when I do get emails from indignant uh, women who have been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, they usually show up in the middle of the night and have bizarre anonymous email addresses like goddessa, or maybe I should just kill myself at gmail.com, or, you know, Medusa's eyeballs bleed at hotmail.com. Just really sick, weird shit. Um, and uh, just as a, a caveat here, uh, to spare myself any comments pointing out that men engage in these behaviors too. Yeah, of course they do. Okay. <laughs> of course they do. We all know that. Nobody's saying that women can't be the victim of stalking and harassment. I'm just trying to bring some awareness to the fact that men are also victims of unwanted harassment and stalking uh, and at nearly equal rates to women, okay? So if you're getting ready to tap that into your keyboard, don't, because I don't read those comments anyway. Uh, okay, next, the courtship pursuit stalking behaviors distinction. How does one best distinguish between enthusiastic romantic pursuit behaviors and stalking and harassment? Perception can be subjective, ergo, one man's bunny boiler is another man's love bomber. In other words, many of the codependents I work with initially experienced common love bombing behaviors as flattering and an indication of how special they must be to their narcissist or, or borderline uh, wooer. While healthier men and women typically find love bombing behaviors overwhelming, over the top, too much too soon, and sometimes downright creepy. Additionally, people who lack boundaries can usually experientially understand that something isn't right about how their ex or this new woman or man is behaving, um, but they, they, they don't see it as harassment and stalking. And that is um, largely due, well, in the case of men, because they don't think of men as being stalked or harassed by women. 
And two, because of the lack of boundaries or poor boundaries, um, they just, they're uncomfortable. It doesn't feel right, but they don't have the language for it. And when that happens, I, of course, explain what constitutes harassment and that feeling uncomfortable, pressured, irritated, etc., is a natural emotional response to being harassed and hunted like an impala on the Serengeti. Questions to determine if you're being harassed or if you just have a number one fan. Based on the research and my professional experiences, I've come up with some questions to ask yourself if you're unsure or confused by uh, how to distinguish between courtship or reconciliation behaviors versus stalking and harassment. So one, are there behaviors unwanted? In other words, would you prefer they stop, go away, and leave you alone? Two, do their behaviors make you uncomfortable, annoyed, irritated, fearful, anxious, paranoid, or angry? As a result, are you depressed, having difficulty sleeping, concentrating, losing interest in your usual activities, isolating yourself, etc.? Three, do their behaviors cause your family, friends, your current girlfriend or wife to feel uncomfortable, annoyed, irritated, fearful, anxious, paranoid, or angry? Four, have you changed your routine so she or he isn't able to accidentally show up where you're typically likely to be? Five, do you feel paranoid and even find yourself looking over your shoulder because you're worried she could just pop up and perhaps you're worried that she could just pop up because she's already done so more than once. Six, has her behavior resulted in you being less open about your life, accomplishments, or good fortune due to fear she'll act out or go crazy from jealousy and or a longing to be included in these parts of your life? Have you closed down your social media due to this person's unwanted attention? Seven, are her behaviors causing you to spend money? For example, attorney's fees on security systems or call blocking apps, etc. Time and energy to avoid her, neutralize the effects of her behavior and or get her to back off. And eight, has the individual persisted in these behaviors after you've specifically told them you're not interested to leave you alone and or to just flat out stop. Now, if you can answer yes to most or even a few of those questions, um, you may very well have a problem on your hands. Um, in coming articles, I'll talk about how the typical course of, of stalking and harassment, um, on average, uh, stalking victims, they're usually the stalker uh, usually can persist on average for seven years, which is uh, quite a significant span of time. And I mean, it may not be consistent and extreme for all seven years, but that's how long the obsession can often last. Uh, phones, cuckoo clocks, dogs. Uh, <laughs> glad to be at the end of this video today. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm distracted by the cuckoo. It's harassing me. Uh, so let's see. Again, um, I'm Dr. Tara Palmatier of shrinkformen.com. If you have a question or would like to schedule a session with me, you can reach me at shrinkformen at gmail.com. Thank you for watching. I apologize for the distractions and have a good day.